Chapter 68 Why does Cress always get to wear the best clothes? Iko whined, crossing her arms, while Cress practiced walking back and forth in the ridiculously tall platform shoes. Cress gets to go to the royal wedding. Cress gets to go to the coronation. Cress has all the fun. I'm not going to the coronation, said Cress, trying to look at her feet without falling over. We're just impersonating guests so we can hack into the palace broadcast system. Cress gets to hack into the palace broadcast system. Cress is risking her life to do this. Cinder threw a pile of shimmering accessories onto the bed. Do any of these match? Aiko flopped onto the bed and started pawing through the accessories with desire-filled eyes. I think these gloves attach to the wing things, she said, following a pitiful sigh. <sighs> I wish my outfit came with fingerless orange elbow-length gloves. These shoes are like stilts, said Cress, wobbling. Isn't there something more practical? I don't think practical is in the lunar vocabulary, said Cinder, diving back into the closet. But I'll look. They'd managed to find a new pair of boots for Cinder, at least, who has lost hers in the lake. They'd found them stacked in the utility closet along with miscellaneous sporting equipment, or what Crest thought was sporting equipment. Unfortunately, there had been nothing small enough to fit her, and Iko had insisted they wouldn't have matched her aristocratic outfit anyway. Tell me I don't look as ridiculous as I feel. Thorn appeared in the doorway, fidgeting with his cuffs. Startled, Cress tripped and crashed into Iko, sending them both tumbling onto the floor. Cinder poked her head out of the closet, surveyed the scene, and bunched up her lips. She disappeared again, muttering, I better find some different shoes. Thorn helped Cress and Iko back to their feet. Maybe ridiculous is the theme of the day he said, tilting his head to survey Cress's outfit, which was part cocktail dress, part butterfly costume. An orange tutu barely reached her mid-thigh and was gaudy enough when paired with a glitz-covered form-fitting bodice. Ugh, this is too much for a little girl, oh my goodness. Two sheer swaths of material have been sewn onto the bodice's back and did in fact connect to the fingerless orange elbow-length gloves. Aiko relinquished. So when Cress spread her arms, it gave the effect of a pair of black and yellow butterfly wings opening up behind her. To top it off, Aiko had found a tiny blue hat in the accessories chest that had a pair of springs and feathered balls on top, what Cress assumed were meant to be antennas. I do feel a little better now that I see what you're wearing. Thorne adjusted his bow tie. He was in a lean plum toned suit that was surprisingly flattering on him despite having been dragged out of a stranger's closet. <laughs> the bow tie had tiny threaded lights running through the fabric, making his white shirt glow in different shades of neon. Okay, that's a little much. He left on his own black military boots. Okay. He looked absurd, but really hot, and Cress had to force herself to look away. You'll fit right in from what I can tell at the feast. Cinder emerged with a pair of more user-friendly shoes. They were all wearing crazy things like this at the feast. I don't doubt that a lot of the clothing was glamour-made, but the fewer elements of your appearance you have to glamour, the easier it is to hold the illusion. Hey, Captain, said Aiko. Stop checking out her legs. Crest turned in time to see Thorne's appreciative grin. Shrugging, he adjusted the cuffs of his jacket. I'm a connoisseur, Aiko. Look how tall those shoes make her look. He hesitated. Well, tallish. Flushing, Cress inspected her bare legs. Cinder rolled her eyes. <sighs> Here, Cress, try these on. Hmm? Oh, right. She removed the torture devices and tossed them to Aiko, who was all too thrilled to slip them onto her feet. Aiko was waltzing around the room's parameter as if she'd been designed with those exact shoes in mind. Oh, yes, she said. I'm keeping these. When Cress had fitted the replacement shoes on her feet, Thorn flicked one of her antenna puffballs and draped an arm around her shoulders. How do we look? Cinder scratched the back of her neck. Aiko tilted her head from one side to the other, as if their appearance might improve from a different angle. I guess you look lunar? Cinder ventured. Nice. Thorn held up a hand for a high five. 
Cress awkwardly complied. Cinder adjusted her ponytail. <sighs> of course, any lunar who's paying attention will be able to tell you're an earthen, and she's a shell, so be careful. Thorn scoffed. <sighs> careful is my middle name, right after Suave and Darling. Do you even know what you're saying half the time? Asked Cinder. Thorn picked up the chip that they transferred Cinder's video onto and handed it to Cress. Put this somewhere safe. She stared, not sure what constituted safe. She had no pockets, no bag, and very little clothing in which to hide anything. Goodness, give her more clothing, guys! Finally, she tucked it inside her bodice. Grabbing Cress's port screen off the vanity, Thorne slid it into a pocket on the inside of his jacket, where she could also see the outline of his handgun. A small knife they had taken from the kitchen vanished into his hands. So quickly, she wasn't sure where he put it. I guess that's it. Scanning over Thorns and Cress's outfits again. Are we ready? If anyone answers no to that question, said Jason, appearing in the hallway with a scowl and tapping fingers, I'm leaving without you. Cress cast her gaze over her friends, realizing they were about to be separated again. Trepidation curled in the pit of her stomach. She and Thorn would go off to the palace while Cinder, Iko, and Jason tried to save Winter and Scarlet and organize the people who would soon be infiltrating Artemisia. She didn't want to leave them. She didn't want to say goodbye. But Thorn's arm was over her shoulders, comfortable and solid. When he tugged on his lapel with his free hand and told the others, We're ready, Cress didn't argue. Later, there's the back entrance said Jason, pointing at a near-invisible door in the back of the medical and research clinic, half-hidden behind overgrown shrubberies. Iko popped up beside him in an attempt to see, but he flattened a hand on her head and forced her to duck down as two men in lab coats strolled by, both of them with their attention stuck to their port screens. Jason scanned the yard one more time before darting out from their cover and ducking into the building's shadow. Through the dome's wall, he could see the desolate landscape of Luna stretching into the distance. He waved his arm, and Cinder and Iko scurried after him, crowding together in the shadows. The door opened easily, no reason to lock doors in a building that was open to the public. But Jason refused to feel relieved. There would be no relief for him until he knew Winter was safe. They scurried into a dim corridor, the walls in need of a coat of paint. Jason listened but all he heard was a squeaky wheel and a clattering cart in some distant hallway. There's a maintenance room down there, he said, pointing, and a janitor's closet on each floor. That door takes you to the main part of the building. How do you know all this? Cinder whispered. I interned here for a few months before the queen decided I would make a decent guard. She thought you were cute! He felt Cinder peering up at him, but he didn't meet the look. That's right. She murmured. He wanted to be a doctor. Whatever. He paced to the screen beside the maintenance room and pulled up a mapped diagram of the clinic. A few red exclamation points glowed in different areas with inserted notes. Patient RM8, non-toxic spill on floor. Lab 13, faulty light switch. Here, said Cinder, pointing to the fourth door of the diagram. Disease research and development. There is a back staircase on the opposite side of the building. It would get them to the right floor, at least. Jason hoped the research team had taken the day off to enjoy the coronation festivities. He didn't want any more complications, and he'd like to avoid killing anyone else if he could. That didn't stop him from loosening his gun, though. The climb to the fourth floor came with no surprises. Jason cracked open the door and scanned the well-lit corridor. He could hear the gurgle of, of water tanks and the hum of computers and the constant growl of machinery, but no people. Indicating for the others to stay close, he slipped out of the stairwell. Their shoes squeaked and thumped on the hard floors. Beside each door, a screen lit up as they passed, indicating the purpose of each room. Agriculture, gen mode development and testing. Bioelectrical manipulation, study number 17, control in groups one through three, Genetic Engineering, Canis Lupus Subjects, number 16 to 20. Genetic Engineering, Canis Lupus Subjects, number 21 
to 23. Genetic engineering. Surgical alteration. Increased manufact. Jason froze. The feminine voice was from somewhere down the hallway and was followed by the slamming of a door or cupboard. Be possible to sustain resources. Another door opened, followed by footsteps. Jason grabbed for the nearest door, but it was locked. Behind him, Cinder tested another handle, sneering when it didn't open either. Here, Aiko whispered, pulling open a door down the hall. Jason and Cinder ducked in after her and shut the door, careful to not make a sound. The lab was empty, or at least empty of people, conscious people. The walls were lined with shelves of suspended animation tanks, filling up the space from floor to ceiling. Each tank hummed and gurgled, their insides lit with faint green lights that made the bodies look like frozen corpses. The far wall was full of even more tanks layered like shut drawers, making it a checkerboard of screens and statistics, glowing light, and the soles of feet. Cinder and Iko ducked behind two of the tanks. Jason backed himself against the wall so he would be hidden if the door opened and be able to take anyone by surprise. The first voice was met with another, male this time. Plenty in stock, but it would be nice if they gave us some indication that this was going to... Jason inhaled as the voice grew louder until footsteps were right outside the door, but the footsteps and voices soon faded in the other direction. Iko peeked around the base of the tank, but he held a finger to his lips. Sinner's face appeared a second later, questioning. Jason gave a cursory glance to the rest of the lab. Each of the suspension tanks had a small tube that connected it to a row of holding containers. Though most of the tubes were clear, a few of them were tinted maroon, with slow flowing blood. <sighs> what is this place? Cinder whispered. Her face was twisted with horror. She was staring at the unconscious form of a child, maybe a few years old. They're shells, he said. She keeps them here for an endless supply of blood. What? For what? Which is used in producing the antidote. When a shell was born and taken away, their families were told they were being killed as part of the infanticide laws. Years ago, they had actually been kept in captivity, secluded dormitories where they were regarded as little more than useful prisoners. Cinder should get those people on her side. But one day, those imprisoned shells had raised a riot. Oh. And unable to be controlled, managed to kill five thaumaturgs and eight royal guards before they'd been subdued. Since then, they've been considered both useful and dangerous, which had led them to the decision to keep them in a permanent comatose state. <gasps> Man, that could have been Cress. Oh my goodness. They were no longer a threat, and their blood could more easily be harvested for their platelets that were used for the Lemosis antidote. You know, I think Winter, I don't remember exactly what she said, but I think Winter was talking about the whole blood platelets stuff. Few people knew the infanticide laws were fake, and that their lost children were still alive, if barely. Jason had never been in this room before, though he'd known it existed. The, re the reality was more appalling than he'd imagined. It occurred to him that if he'd succeeded in becoming a doctor and escaped this fate of a palace guard, he may have ended up in, in this same lab. Only instead of helping people, he'd be using them. Iko had gone back to the door. I don't hear anyone in the hallway. Right, we should go. No, free them, Cinder. Cinder brushed her fingertips over the tank of the young children. Her eyes crinkled with sadness. But also, if Jason knew anything about her, a touch of determination. He suspected she was already planning the moment when she would come back here and see them all freed. Chapter 69 the two people they'd heard in the hallway were nowhere to be seen. They soon found the door labeled Disease Research and Development, right where the diagram had told them it would be. Are they gonna find Wolf? The lab was filled with designated stations, each one with a stool, a metal table, a series of organized vials, and test tubes and petri dishes, a microscope, and a stand of drawers, impeccably clean. The air tasted sterile and bleached. Holographed nodes hung on the walls, all turned off. Two lab stations showed evidence of recent work. 
spotlights blaring on petri dishes, and tools abandoned on the desk. Spread out, said Cinder. Iko took the cabinets on the far side of the room. Cinder started pawing through open shelving. Jason started on the nearest workstation, scanning the labeled drawers. In the top drawer, he found an outdated port screen, a label printer, a scanner, and a set of empty vials. The rest were full of syringes and petri dishes and microscope lenses, still in protective wrapping. He moved on to the second station. Is this it? Jason's attention snapped to Iko, who was standing in front of a set of floor-to-ceiling cabinets with their doors thrown open, revealing row upon row and stack upon stack of small vials, each filled with a clear liquid. Jason joined her in front of the cabinets and lifted one vial from its tray. The label read, EU1, Pathogenic Bacteria, Limosis, Strain B, Polyvent Vaccine. It was identical to the lid on the next vial, and the next. Jason's gaze traveled over the hundreds of trays. Let's get a rolling cart for maintenance and fill it up with as many trays as we can. We probably won't need all of this for one sector, but I'd rather it be in our possession than Lavana's. I'll get a cart, said Iko, rushing for the door. Cinder ran a finger across a row of vials, listening to them clink in their trays. This right here is half the reason Kai is going through with this, she whispered, then clenched her jaw. This could have saved Peony. This is going to save Winter. When he heard the cart in the hallway, Jason started pulling trays off the shelves, and together they loaded the cart as high as they could, stacking tray upon tray of antidote. His pulse was racing. Every time he shut his eyes, he could see her in that tank, clinging for survival. How long would the immersion protect her? How long did he have? Iko had brought a heavy drop cloth from the maintenance closet too, and they draped it over the cart, tucking it around the edges of the trays to stabilize them for their journey. They were pushing the cart toward the door when they heard the ding of the elevator. Ding! They froze. Jason planted his hands across the covered vials to keep them from clinking. You don't seem to understand the predicament we're in said a sharp female voice. We need those guards returned to activity duty immediately. I don't care if they're fully healed or not. Thaumaturg, Cinder whispered. Her eyes were closed, her face tense with concentration. And two, I'm going to guess, servants maybe? Or lab technicians? And one other, really weak energy, possibly a guard. No offense taken, Jason muttered. These orders have to come from the queen herself and we have no time to waste, continued the thaumaturg. Stop making excuses and do your jobs. Not trusting his own body if there was a thaumaturg nearby, Jason drew his gun and pushed it into Cinder's hand. She looked confused at first, but comprehension came fast. Her grip tightened. Footsteps approached, and Jason wondered if the thaumaturg had already sensed them, frozen and waiting inside this laboratory. Maybe she thought they were just researchers, the ruse would be up as soon as she saw them, if she walked past the slab, or if she was coming to the slab. But no, a door opened down the hallway. He didn't hear it shut again, and there were no other exits. To get to either the stairs or the elevator, they'd have to go back the way they'd come. Maybe we can wait it out, suggested Iko. They have to leave eventually. He scowled. Eventually wasn't soon enough. I'll take control of the guard and the other two, said Cinder, knuckles whitening. I'll kill the thaumaturg and wait until you're all clear before I follow you. You'll raise a lot of alarms, said Jason. Her gaze turned icy. I've already raised a lot of alarms. I'll go, said Iko. Her chin was up, her face resolute. They can't control me. I'll draw them off and find a place to hide until you come back. You have to get this antidote to Her Highness. Iko, no. We should stay together. Iko cupped Cinder's face. Her fingers still weren't functioning, so the touch looked awkward, like being petted by an oversized doll. Like I said, I'd do anything to keep you safe. Besides, if anything happens to me, I know you'll fix it. Iko winked, then marched bravely out into the hallway. Jason shut the door after her. They heard Iko's measured footsteps beating down the hallway, then a pause. Oh, hello! came her cheery voice. 
followed by the sound of a chair screeching across the floor. Oops, I didn't mean to startle you. What are? The Thaumturg's voice cut out, then turned vile. A shell? Close, said Aiko. In case you don't recognize me, I happen to be good friends with Princess Elite. Why are you telling them, Aiko? I'm willing to guess you've heard of... Apprehend her. I guess you have. There was a rush of footsteps, a crash of furniture, two gunshots that made Cinder flinch. Stop her! Screamed the thaumaturg, farther away now. A door slammed shut. That sounded like the stairwell, said Jason. Cinder's jaw was tight, her muscles taut, but she drew in a shaking breath and squared her shoulders. We'd better get out of here before they come back. Okay, that's the end of chapter 69. Chapters 70 and 71 are coming out next Monday. Thanks for listening, guys. Please like, subscribe, do all that jazz. You know what to do. Now, I'll see you guys next time. Laters!